Hey, what's up guys? Welcome back. Today we're continuing our series on the Home Depot guitar kit, which is our SG style guitar kit from Solo Music Gear using only stuff from like Home Depot, Walmart, and your average hardware store, and no power tools except for a soldering iron. As you all know, this is a competition with Big D Guitars. He has one of these guitar kits too. And uh, yeah, he's doing something pretty awesome with his. Following the same rules, hardware store type stuff only, only the soldering iron for power tools. It makes for an interesting build. So remember to check out his channel in the description, see what he's going on. He's got something really cool happening. If you want one of these, I know you know this, check out the Solo Music Gear link in the description. You can buy it through there. That's my affiliate link. If you don't like me, don't use that link, but go to solomusicgear.com and pick one up because they're awesome. They're fun to build. They make for a pretty good guitar. So in the last video, I did this paint job. I know you've seen it. If you haven't, check it out. It is, it's space. And as you will have seen in that video, I did some texturing techniques to get the detail on the moons and the planet. So that creates texture. Now we need to sand a little bit so that we can put our next coats of clear on. What I did at the end of that is I put one quick coat of clear on within my recoat time so I wouldn't have to worry about sanding. And I did that to protect the graphics that I have here so that I'd have something to sand when I came back without sanding right over my graphics. I've got a piece of 400 grit sandpaper here. I'm just gonna fold it in half and I'm gonna lightly scuff this up so I can begin adding clear coat to bury these graphics, to bury that texture and make sure I end up with a smooth finish. Now my end game on this one is actually semi-gloss. Because it's an SG style guitar, and notwithstanding that I put space graphics on it, I wanted kind of a more vintage sheen, a more vintage look on the front. So I'm going with the semi-gloss. Another reason for that is because I don't have power tools in this one, so I can't use a polishing wheel or buffer, and I didn't want to polish by hand. So I'm not going to use gloss. It just makes sense. But something you should know, and a lot of people don't know this, when you're building up coats to be able to bury graphics and stuff, even if you're finishing with a semi-gloss, a satin, or a matte, you want to do your build-up work with a gloss. Now that probably seems a little counterintuitive. We all know you can't paint directly over gloss. You have to sand it to be able to get the next layer to stick. The thing is, those satins, those mattes, and those semi-glosses, what they have is actually an additive in them to make them look that way. So they start basically with a gloss formula and they add something to make them, you know, have less sheen. And unfortunately, the result is if you build too much of it up, you can end up with kind of these white specks, a little bit of haze within your paint, within your clear coat. And generally, you don't want that. So the best way to do it is build it up with gloss. And then when you're between clear coat sessions, you sand it. The gloss also works as a diagnostic tool because you can tell when you've sanded everything properly, there won't be any gloss left. So I'm gonna build up three coats of gloss at a time. I'm probably gonna do this twice, but I'm gonna see how it looks after I do it once and then sand back. First thing I'm gonna do is take that 400 grit paper, scuff this thing down so that this will stick, put my three coats on 10 minutes apart, you know, your average flash time, and then uh, yeah, may or may not do another three coats after that. Sand that nice and flat, and the final thing I will do is one coat of the semi-gloss clear. And that'll be it for the front. I'm also gonna put my little initials or whatever on the headstock using a Sharpie paint pen from Home Depot. Uh, I think you can get these at Walmart as well. Gonna do that and I'll put that under a couple layers of clear as well because this will build up a little bit of paint. So pretty straightforward stuff. We're gonna get to work on the sanding. As usual, make sure you're protecting yourself. Make sure you've got a mask. Whether it's a dust mask for the sanding part or a respirator isn't really important, but it makes more sense to have a respirator because you need that for the painting anyway. You can get one of these at Home Depot or you can go to the Amazon link in the description and pick one up through there. There's a full face version as well. That's enough talk. Let's get started on this. So for this part, I'm using some 400 grit paper. It's about the finest that I could find at Home Depot, and I think Walmart's probably fairly similar for that. You don't want to go any rougher than that. Um, generally speaking, when I do something like this, I will sand with either 600 between color coats or 800 between coats of clear when necessary. So for this, I would typically use 800. It's a little rougher. Uh, so 400 or 600 isn't too bad of an idea here and because of the limited access to materials that we've got as part of the rules for this particular build 400 is just fine. You'll see that I'm trying to sand predominantly with my palm when I do the flat areas and then of course when I come into these bevels I use my fingers. You want to avoid using your fingertips and fingers too much when you're doing the flat areas uh, if possible because that tends to create grooves 
you're obviously pushing harder with the fingertips themselves, and you know you're going to create a little bit of waviness there. The palm is not fantastic, but it's better than the fingers. Ideally, you would use a block. You can see here I'm signing the headstock using one of these Sharpie paint pens. They're an oil-based paint that you put out, and they're actually pretty decent. So I'm kind of happy with that little product. I didn't realize that Sharpie made those. Make sure you clean your surface before you spray. You want to use a wax and grease remover of some kind. I've used Windex in the past for this sort of thing, and that works fine. Or lighter fluid, or ideally an actual wax and grease remover. Get all your fingerprints and stuff off there. Get all the dust off. And make sure you've got a nice clean surface to spray. You can see I'm using two cans here. This is the technique that I demonstrated and explained in my video on how to clear coat better with spray cans. That video is ancient and uh, not great quality, but it gets the message across and kind of explains the reasoning. Briefly though, the reason is you can put more paint on more quickly. So it emulates a paint gun better if you do it properly than you would be able to do with one paint can. Now, it is a bit of a difficult technique. It takes a little bit of practice to be able to do it properly with two paint cans, but I think you'll find it easier than you imagine it to be. You can clearly see quite a bit of texture there in that first wet coat. Now, that will level off a little bit, and most paints do tend to self-level a little, little bit as they dry, but of course, we're going to do more than one coat. One, because that'll help level it a little bit more, and two, because we need to make sure that we've got a fair bit of paint buildup on there, in order to have some thickness that we can sand through to flatten this back out. That's how you bury graphics, you add a few coats, and we'll do about three coats per session here before we need to sit back and let this thing dry. Generally, if you do more than three or four coats, you run the risk of the first layers going on and not being able to dry properly when the top layers dry over the top of them and don't allow the solvents to release anymore. All right, we'll call that round one. That is three coats, about 10 minutes apart. It's really warm in here, so they were flashing pretty quickly. Sometimes you're gonna to wanna to wait more like 15 minutes if they're you know, flashing a little slower because it's colder. Um, that's a fair bit of clear. So we're gonna come back in a couple days and reassess this, literally like two days from now. Everything should be dry by then. I mean, stuff's tacky now. It should be dry enough that I can sand it. When I go to sand it flat, I'm going to use a block this time. You can use anything flat as a block. It can be a chunk of wood, whatever. You can buy a block from any one of the stores that we've talked about. I'm going to use a block this time. I'm going to block it out and try to get it as close to flat as possible. Now, when you do that, I mean, you can play it safe and block it out kind of close to flat and then add another three coats and do it again. Or if you're comfortable, keep going until you think, you know, I've been at this for a while. I might be too close to burning through. If you can get it perfectly flat without doing another three coats, then there's really no point in doing them. You block it flat and then add your, your satin or your semi-gloss or your matte or more gloss if that's what you want. In my case, that's what I'm going to hope for. But if I need to, I will sand it kind of close to flat with the sanding block and then finish it off by hand to kind of let it get into the texture a little bit so I make sure that all of that gloss is gone, add another three coats, and then play that game again. Now this time around I'm using a sanding block because for this portion of course the objective really is to get the finish flat. I'm still using that 400 grit for the same reason as before, mainly because it's as fine as I can go. Generally between coats of clear for this portion I would use 6 or 8, just like before. We've got a lot less texture that we're dealing with this time because we now have our three coats of clear on there and we've done that first round of a little bit of scuffing on the first layer so that we kind of leveled things off ever so slightly there. This time, I want to get it pretty much dead flat. It doesn't have to be 100% dead flat because the next coat will level off a little bit. But the closer we are, the closer we're going to end up to dead flat when everything's all said and done. Because this is going to be a semi-gloss finish in the end, I can't really flatten and polish that last coat. So I really do have to make sure that this is pretty darn close to a dead flat surface when I start, otherwise we're going to end up with that texture coming through in the final coat. Now my goal here ideally is to get this flat enough that I only need the one coat of semi-gloss to finish it off. If we're not quite there, we can do another two or three coats of the gloss, wait for it to dry, sand it flat, and then do the coat of semi-gloss, or as kind of a middle ground if you will, 
you can sand this and get really close to flat but not quite there and then all you need to do is usually add a couple coats of semi-gloss possibly with a sanding in between them if the first one doesn't quite work out. Now you guys will get a better look at exactly how flat this ends up and how nice it looks in my next video but for this one I put on my one coat of semi-gloss and you can see that it ends up getting really really close so what I'm going to end up doing probably is coming in and doing one more coat of it to really make sure that I've got a nice flat surface and I don't have any orange peel left over. The only imperfections that will be in my final finish there are whatever crop up in my very last coat of semi-gloss and of course my goal will be to limit that as much as possible and make sure that that last coat is as close to perfect as I can get it. As always, once you're done sanding before you spray, make sure you clean everything off with some wax and grease remover. And now here I'm coming in, I just have the one can of semi-gloss, I don't go for the double this time, and I'm spraying in the opposite direction from before. None of this is sped up, I'm moving pretty quick because I'm a little closer to the surface than a lot of people like to be. As you move further from the surface, of course you need to move slower in order to make sure that you're getting a proper coat. But I usually spray from about 6 to 8 inches away and I move a little bit faster. There are still some imperfections in here that will level off as that coat dries, and that's not a problem. I'll come in with another one if necessary. For the back and sides, I haven't taped off the front because I'm spraying at an angle, so I don't end up getting any on the front. Of course, you can tape off the front, but the front of this guitar isn't even dry yet when I do this. I'm spraying the hammered paint here. This is a specific type of paint that gives a hammered finish, which is a textured type of finish but it's a glossy, smoother kind of texture as opposed to that more granulated texture that you get from the texture paints themselves, so to speak. And this stuff is interesting because if you apply it more heavily, the silicone in it causes it to pull more and create a more significant hammered effect, a more significant texture. Whereas if you spray it lighter, and I've sprayed it relatively light, you get a less pronounced effect and more of a smooth looking finish. Well, we are almost done. She's looking good so far. So as you guys have seen, we've got our awesome kind of space painting thing on the front. We now have our semi-gloss finish on there. I used the hammered silver paint on the back and sides. So that's got an interesting little texture to it. You'll see that up closer uh, soon. But the great thing about this is you don't need to clear coat it. In fact, you can't. It's got something in it, an additive. I think it's a silicone based additive that causes the paint to pull together and it does so more the heavier you put it on. But in any event, that will also ruin anything that you put on top of it usually. So don't even try to clear coat over it. This stuff is basically bulletproof. No problems there. Once it's fully dry, it doesn't need to be protected. So that's what we've got going so far. We've got the signed headstock, and then the back of the neck and the back of the headstock are raw wood, and I'm gonna put the finish on that in the next video, and then it's gonna be time to get this thing put back together. Well, let me know what you think of this in the comment section below. I'd be happy to hear your thoughts as always. And as always, thank you for watching the video. Hope you enjoyed it. If you did, please feel free to give it a thumbs up. I would appreciate that. Remember to subscribe as you can see how this thing gets finished off. And I will see you next time. Have a good one.